if we're this great social organ, how come kids do this kind of thing? Like, does he not know how much his mother would freak <laughs> if she saw this? How many would want to try this, right? Most adults, most adults don't want to do this kind of thing. Why? What stops us as adults? Fear. Fear of what? Consequences. <laughs> like something really bad might happen, eh? You know? Like what if the bungee thing doesn't work? What happens to the bike? Well, you know, most people look at this and, you know, th their face kind of screws up and their bum tightens up. And, you know, <laughs> so, some people, I always say this, some people kind of want to look in and see, is that my kid? Is it? <laughs> anyway, we don't do this kind of thing. Does this guy know that this is dangerous? Does he know that it's dangerous? He does. Was he thinking about it? Was he thinking about the danger? Did he think everything about getting to do this? You bet. He thought about it. But how did he decide to do this? What made him want to do this rather than saying, oh, oh, oh too dangerous? It was the thrill. It was the thrill. So what we know about adolescents is because their brains are changing, the buzz of the thrill and the sensation seeking has way, way, way more clout than the, uh-oh, it might not work, right? So really, really important to know that it's not that they weren't thinking, though if you, has anybody ever asked a teenager, what were you thinking? Anybody? Has anybody received an answer? <laughs> Nyet. But the brain is changing. Now we might say, okay, well, you know, it didn't used to be this way. It didn't used to be this way, but guess what? This is Socrates. 400 frickin' BC, like how many years ago is that? Was talking about the youth. They no longer stand up for their elders. They gobble up dainties at the table. I love that one. So there was something way back then, or there were grumpy old farts way back then. Aristotle talked about this period of time. Um, Shakespeare talked about it. So there has always been, and in fact there is in every mammal species, there is a period of time where the animal, the species, the boys and girls have more novelty seeking, thrill seeking, and explore and go away from the home. Biologically wired in all species. Here's the problem. There's a heck of a lot of dangerous things you can get into. And here's another problem, is that we have biologically changed how life unfolds. It used to be that you would have childhood, and then you'd have puberty, and then within a couple of years, you would take on having a family, right? Now, that is no longer the case. It's still the case in some um, uh, hunter-gatherer agricultural uh, societies, but what we have is first period is around 10 or 11 in girls. First baby is 28, 29. So we have a mismatch between the biology and the social reality. Peter Gluckman describes this. He's an evolutionary biologist. So we now have a brand new stage of mankind. We never had this before, called emerging adulthood, also known as the finished one uh, college uh, course uh, degree, and now they're back in the frickin' basement. <laughs> Anybody know this, right? So. Emerging adulthood. Now we might say, what's wrong with those kids that they're not being launched, right? What's wrong with these kids? What's wrong with those parents that they're bringing the, them back into the house? Wrong and wrong. Society is what has changed dramatically. Society has changed hugely. Kids used to be involved in the economy. Kids were working up until the Depression and the Second World War. Part of the reason high school was introduced was to do something with all the kids who were no longer working. We have changed our society dramatically. And now we have kids who are hothoused in high school. Now, how long does it go? Well, it starts, I said, 
at uh, this change in adolescent brain starts around 10 and continues until 24 or 25. Later in males, sometimes a lot later <laughs> in some males. Nobody's looking at the guys in the room. No, no, don't do that. So what we have then what we have is a situation where we have kids with the biological drive to connect with others, to mate, to leave home in a society that hasn't created or supported them in the developing of the skills to be independent. They haven't needed to. We're looking after them. We've got snowplow parents and we've got helicopter parents. We have parents who are calling when their kids are in university, true story, calling up to say, can you increase her mark just by one or two points because she wants to apply to medical school. So these are parents calling university professors. This was one of my friends and she said, if your kid needs his mother to call up. I don't want them to be my doctor. <laughs> but that is the world. Now, is it the kid's fault? The world has changed. The world has changed. Here's an example. A, a, a family doctor came up to me and said, you know, I don't get it. When I was 16, I joined the Merchant Navy. By 19, I was a captain. What has happened now? You can't imagine an 18-year-old leaving. Some of you will have family who came across from Italy or Poland or lots of places. They were 18 breaking out on their own. We cannot imagine our kids doing that. Why? Because sociologically, things have changed dramatically. We have not built the skill set. Now, that's not true in India. In India and in other cultures, the young people have a sense of uh, one, belonging in the community, two, contributing. They have intergenerational connection with others. They have more service learning. They have more learning on the ground. Now here's an easy way to remember um, um, this difference that's happened over time. The when I was a kid, so how parenting has changed over time. When I was a kid, when we played musical chairs, you took away a chair. <laughs> now, do they, did parents take away chairs? Oh, no, oh my Lord, that would hurt their feelings. They wouldn't have a place to sit. Yeah, that's the frickin' point. So we've changed things dramatically, right? And then we say, then we say, these kids nowadays, they're so entitled. Well, who's the one that gave them a trophy for turning up every time? Who's the one that gave them a trophy for breathing in and out all day long? Good, here you go, you get a sticker. We really need to be thinking about the conditions because what happens is when kids do have their brain risk-taking, we go back to vroom. That's not what we would have done in our day and age. Well, it's not our day and age. It's not our day and age. There are so many more things going on, but the biology to take risks is still there. It's still there. The risks are greater. This is a friend of mine. We were driving from Edmonton to Lloydminster and her son sent her a text. This is her 12-year-old son. She said, he said, it's okay, mom, dad has already grounded me. So what was driving him? Was it, I'm gonna show mom I can do what I want? Nah, not at all, not at all. He wanted the dopamine. Dopamine is our reward neurotransmitter in our brain. He wanted that rush. He wanted that rush. So what we now know is that the brain changes in adolescence in a way we didn't know. This is Jay Geed. The blue stuff is maturing of the brain. It is maturing from the back to the front, from the inside out. And the very last areas to develop are the prefrontal cortex. The frontal lobes, you'll be happy to know, are those areas that are responsible for governing emotions. When you have a fully developed frontal lobe, you are able to 
have good judgment, plan, organize, problem solve, inhibit your impulses. Is this sounding like a bug list of any of the mums and dads in the room? about what gets us, drives us crazy about our kids. I was telling stories um, earlier today about one of my wondrous children who will go unnamed, Jojo, who um, uh, we had uh, all of our kids, I'm from Hamilton, and all of our kids uh, were ski, we went to ski racing. And so we have no hill in Hamilton. You know, you know how you've got Bowler? Well, we're, we don't have, even have Bowler Hill. We had to drive two and a half hours up north for a 30 second ski run and drive two and a half hours back. All right, so one day my son uh, Jojo has forgotten his helmet. Now who's heard about logical consequences? So logical consequences would have said, oh dear honey, I'm so sorry, but I guess if you don't race this time, you'll never forget your helmet again, will you? Chuck you, Farley, five hours of driving and I'm not gonna see my kid race. And also, it's my guy Jojo and there's no way I have a guarantee that he won't forget another time. So instead, I think brain under construction. Brain under construction. Put that in your brain. Brain under construction. I need to help him develop those pathways in the brain to help him plan. I'm not going to pack his bag for him. I don't even make his lunch. I'm not packing his bag. I don't make his bed. He makes his bed. He needs to learn how to better plan. So we make a list of what needs to be in that bag before we pull out of the driveway at five o'clock in the morning. So this is, how's the list? Have you got the list? What's the list? And eventually he said, mom, it doesn't matter. You don't have to ask me. Everything goes into my bag as soon as I come off the, off, off the hill. It's a public health hazard. You know, just drop it all in there. But he has developed the pathways. I didn't develop them for him. Do you see the difference? I did not develop them for him. I recognize planning and organizing becomes way more challenging in your teen years. That area of the brain is developing differently. He may have been a perfect organizer in grade five, but then the brain started to change. He's much more interested in checking out his favorite football player so that he can talk about it with his buddies because he needs to connect. He needs to be in that tribe. What's driving him is important to him is his peers. What's driving and important to him is fitting in and having a sense of belonging. I need to recognize that. Otherwise, I can go on a complete and utter rant, which I'm rather good at, I must say. Another story about Jojo. So he uh, asked him to tidy up the kitchen. You know, we're a big family. We all have to uh, contribute. I come in um, and there's a huge box in front of the, uh, the fridge. It's huge. I say, Jojo, I asked you to tidy up the kitchen. What about the box? He said, oh, mum, I didn't see it. It is so big, you could get lost in it. I said, what do you mean you didn't see it? Well, he didn't see it. But he also said to me, mum, why is it that you always notice the things I don't do, but you don't notice the things I do do? Oh, zing, you got me there, Jojo. This is my wondrous boy who says, you know, it's no picnic being the son of a child psychiatrist. <laughs> but you see where that is. He was focused on other things. I could have had a major rant. Otherwise, I'd just say, Joe, the box, the box. Any of you have challenges when you walk in the front door? and there's a backpack and shoes that you have gone on and on about, you know, and, and so I did, I did the rants. You know what, you leave your backpack there and your Nana's gonna come in and she's gonna trip on it, she's gonna fall, she's gonna fracture her hip, get in hospital, and then she's getting a urinary tract infection, she's gonna become demented, and then she's gonna die. <laughs> right? Yeah. How does that work? Not well. Low emotion, few words. The backpack's there, you say, the backpack. 
the backpack. But you also know that planning and organizing is challenging, the teen brain under construction. So what you do is you help them make routines and plans. The backpack needs to go there because that's where you do your homework. That's where you do your studying. We remember things better when we recall where we learned them. So that's why having a routine, having a place, and helping them organize really makes a difference. One thing that really drives me crazy uh, that happened in my kids' school is the teachers in grades seven and eight would say, you know, earlier they had their journals, um, um, their organizers that they would write the homework in. Suddenly in grades seven and eight, the teachers would say, no, 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 we're not writing in that anymore. High school's coming and they don't hold your hand. Completely wrong. The grade seven and eights need that to build those neuron pathways way more than the grade threes and fours do. Those little grade threes and fours remember everything, even the stuff that you said you were gonna write up on the board and forgot. So they, knowing what the brain needs is gonna be helpful. So what are some of the other things that we now know? Well, we know that this is a time when what the brain is doing is building and sculpting that brain. So if they are uh, doing Taekwondo, if they're connecting with their grandparents, if they are playing sports, that, those brain cells are firing over and over and over again. And as they fire more together, they get wired up. And the ones that they don't use get snipped away. If they are playing Grand Theft Auto and not seeing friends, only texting and only being on Facebook and not having face to face, that is also what is building their brain. So it's an amazing time, an amazing time for creativity, for emotional spark. We have to be aware though that the pruning and the remodeling is affected by good experiences and bad experiences. So that pruning and remodeling can be all about a kid who's never liked school, comes to high school and has bad experiences with the teachers and says, this is just proving what I've always known. I suck at school, I hate school, nobody likes me here, screw it. That pruned and remodeled his brain. Or a kid who's never liked school comes into school and there's a teacher uh, starts talking to him of, hey, I'm excited, I'm going to a Pink Floyd concert. Pink Floyd? Pink Floyd saved my youngest son's life because he's always hated school. He had a teacher in grade six and I, I noticed he was happier and you know, I've been, I was trying lots and hard things and he comes home in grade six and he's happier and I said, hey, you seem happier. And he says, yeah, yeah, I like Mr. Garrett. How come? I think he likes children. <laughs> what has his experience been? If he has had an experience throughout school that the teachers did not like him, that they were not interested in him. I didn't think to ask him, do you think the teachers like you? I never thought to ask him that, but his experience was being built by a perception that nobody particularly cared about him in school. He knew it at home, so here he has this teacher, this teacher who loved music. So then he goes to grade nine, and it's through in being introduced to Pink Floyd and having a science teacher who he could, um, um, he could uh, jest around with about what year that album came. And another, um, the next year, an English teacher who really took an interest in him, knew who he was, knew who he was, knew his name. There's only a handful of teachers that I could identify in my son's life that that was the case. I don't even know that it's a handful. I didn't have to worry about that at all with my four other kids. It wasn't an issue for them. My son was a child that would have been labeled at risk. I say garbage. He was a child and is a child at promise. We need to shift our thinking. The teachers who he engaged with 
were the ones who saw him at promise, not at risk. What does that mean for us then as we're thinking as parents? We need to think about our kids recognizing that their brain is changing a lot. They are way more emotional now. Their brains are changing. The emotional areas are changing. They are driven to be with their peers. They are driven to affiliate with their peers for a very strong biological reason. All mammals, it's the same. You know, they, they want to leave the nest. Now here's the problem. We get told on the media and television that as they're leaving the nest, it means they dislike us and they want to discard us. That is completely, utterly wrong and false. Just because kids are attaching to their peers does not mean that they are less attached to us. They do not love us less just because they need to connect with their peers. But as parents, we absolutely can feel that. I remember an absolutely disastrous family holiday where we rented a houseboat up in Tomogamy and the frickin' engine broke. And we were in a little cove. There's lots to the story about me trying to fix the radio and breaking it. There's lots of stories. Anyway, so we are in this little cove. We put towels and we write SOS on towels on top of, you know, those houseboats, you know, all those rats and mice and everything. So we have that. Well, my Kathleena was absolutely miserable absolutely miserable. This is my number two, absolutely miserable. And I remember being broken hearted when she said, you know, here, we're just trying to manage all of this. I just really want my friends. And oh God, that hurt. And then I started reading about the teenage brain. I said, oh, isn't it good that she has a source of support? Are you kidding? I was really, I didn't get it. I didn't know why she needed her friends. Why didn't she just want us? In that crisis situation, she wanted to be with her people, her friends to talk about, oh my God, you should hear what my mom just said to my dad. You know, as my, as my, as my husband, I'm up at the top and he's going there and we're, we're running, uh, and this was another part of the trip, and we're running aground and uh, Jim yells at me and I go, are you yelling at me? Are you kidding? Don't be worrying about him yelling at you, worrying about the fact that you are cracking the propeller because you're going right up on the ground. Anyway, too much information, all right. Moving on. So how social a species are we? Look at this picture. Look at this picture and what is it you see? You see a guy lying down on the ground who has just missed a very important soccer shot. And what do you notice? all those people doing the same thing. Now, did they go to a class that said, this is what you do when you see a distressing thing in soccer? They're all doing the same thing. Look at it, except, uh, except the guys in yellow. Check out the yellow guys, the other team. So what this is showing us, what a profoundly social, profoundly social species we are. We, they are all, if you were to ask them, what were you feeling? You would get an overwhelmingly similar response. We are wired to connect. Our kids need to be with their peers. Why? So biologically, and there's a great book called um, uh, Brainstorm, biologically, if our little cave boys and girls, particularly our little cave boys, had just been lying around the cave having fun and never left the home or never tried fun things to do, then we would not be here as a species. In fact, if their brain had not changed to make them restless, have you ever heard a teenager say, I'm bored? Can you imagine, what would you say if you were a cave mum and your kids said, I'm bored? You can't say, go out and play with the traffic. You know, go off and find a lion. So what the scientists are saying, 
the scientists are saying is that the brain changes where there's more thrill-seeking, more novelty-seeking, more leaving the nest to go and find your peers, made sure that we didn't have inbreeding, made sure that our, our species populated more of the planet. How did it come about? Because there's a change in the teenage brain where the amount of reward transmitter, dopamine, is being changed. Their baseline amount of dopamine is lower. So yeah, they become restless. They were perfectly fine just hanging around home. Anybody gone on a trip to Florida with the kids and it worked perfectly when they were seven and nine, but by the time they were 11 and 13, it was a nightmare. Same kids, different stuff going on in their brain, more restlessness. So we've got pruning and sculpting going on. We've got a huge drive to be social. We have hyper-rationality. So that, oops, Daisy, oops, bye-bye. Oh, okay. Yes, um, where did it go? I just lost my PowerPoint. So what we have, this hyper-rationality, is the kids are focusing more on the reward that they are going to get and less on the consequences of it not going well. So, Focusing on things going beautifully and less on things not going well creates quite a few challenges. Oh my goodness, oh, are you, oh, oh. So, what does it mean then that we are gonna do as parents to deal with our kids in these situations? We know that they are having this dilemma of their emotional brain saying, do it now, and their prefrontal cortex under construction, which is gonna say, hang on. So what can we do as parents? Well, we then, we have to examine what is it that we bring to parenting? When we know that our kids are gonna to want to have sensation seeking, are we thinking about how can we create the environments for them to be able to do that safely? There are communities that are banning skateboarding for kids. And I think, are you freaking nuts? You ban skateboarding, then kids find more dangerous places to do it. They have a drive, a drive for that thrill seeking. So why not create safe spaces? Now you can't make it too safe, or you know, that's just so sick, you know, that's no good. You need to have it by asking kids, what is it that we can do to help with this sensation seeking, but that it's less dangerous? Is it a challenge? It absolutely is. Because as you see here, I try to get pictures where you see kids together. Because that novelty seeking, thrill seeking brain, the stop, plan and think about it goes down when they're in groups. It goes down. I remember the first of my son, my eldest son's friends coming home, uh, coming to the house to pick up Andrew. He was the first one to get his license. And so he comes, I say, hey, Rob, you, you got your license? And he says, yeah, pretty lucky, I guess. I said, it better not have been luck, Rob. <laughs> and as Andrew was getting in the car, I'm saying, do not talk to him. Do not turn on the radio. No one else gets in the car, right? Now, the truth is, I cannot protect my kids from all of the dangers that are out there because the dangers are huge. The dangers are absolutely huge. I cannot protect my kids from, uh, from there. How many of you ask your kids, is there gonna be alcohol? Waste of breath, there is. How many of you um, uh, wonder if your kids are exposed to or would be able to get marijuana? Don't worry, they can. Actually, if you're in Hamilton, it's easier than anywhere else in the country. I'm, t I'm told, not from personal experience, but from a paper I read. So here we have our kids with so many fast things. None of these are home pictures, just so you know. 
So we have kids in a really danger, provocative environment. How can we protect them? What can we do? Keeping them home doesn't do it. Keeping them home doesn't do it. You force a kid to stay in, they find a way to go out the window. What is it that we can do? So then it comes back to what are the principles that we started with about what is our view of the child? And what is it that we want for our kids? We want them to be capable and competent. We want them to be able to thrive, to when they've got these difficult decisions to make the right ones. But if they don't, we want them to know that no matter what time of day or night, they can call and we will come. As my, um, my, one of my children, who I will not name, uh, gave me a call one time. He was out in our, oh, I was talking about this, our suburb, but uh, he was out in a car, in a big car, um, and he calls to say, Mom, I've wrecked the transmission. Right? And so I said, okay, I'm coming to get you. And one of the first things he said to me, Mom, was, Mom, you know, it just meant so much to me that that's what your response was. I'm coming to get you. Did he learn a lesson? Oh my Lord, he learned an amazing lesson there. Did I need to do any more for him to get it? No way. He got it. My intention as a parent was to make sure that he had understood what had happened, but then to help him deal with what had happened. If my mindset was, I have to make him mind, and I have to make him know, then I would have treated him very, very differently. I would have punished him by grounding him. And then how would he have felt? Would he have felt, thank you very much, mum, for dealing with me in that way? Or would he become more angry? There's a difference between discipline and punishment. Punishment makes you mad. Punishment makes you want to get back at the person. Discipline helps you internalize what it is that's happened. We don't learn from our experiences. We learn from examining our experiences. And our kids are not going to examine their experiences if all of their emotion is focused on how much they're mad at us. So, when we're thinking about the teenage brain, the adolescent brain, we need to, I would suggest, we need to be thinking about how the brain is developing. What are the things that we know that are happening there? And then also, what is it that we know are the features that help kids thrive? Because that's what we want for our kids, right? We want them to thrive. We know from a really very good, I'm just looking for it here, a very good piece of work that was done by the YMCA and the United Way about what are the factors that help kids thrive. And they are environments that help them, one, become, uh, develop autonomy. And autonomy is all about knowing who you are and what you can do. The second is um, having an environment and relationships that help you feel related and connected. So a sense of belonging, a sense that you can actually do something and make a difference. They're the kinds of things that help our kids thrive. We can talk now about um, uh, some of your questions and some of the ways that we have to get our heads around this way of understanding kids. Because some of us grew up in families where it was brick wall, you know, my way or the highway. Some of us grew up in families that were permissive, you know, oh, don't put the cat in the microwave, okay, honey, okay, honey. So we've got lots of, lots of, lots and lots and lots of love but not very much in the way of expectations, of uh, limits. 
And then we have families who are backbone families, and this is the work of Barbara Colorosa. And that's backbone families are families who have clear expectations and high expectations, but they have some flexibility. They have flexibility. They can say, you want to do something? Convince me, tell me. But they are situations where the young person's voice is heard and is valued. Where the idea in families who are democratic and uh, that have the back, our backbone parents, they respect the creativity and the, um, uh, the curiosity of the kids. The backbone family is the type of interaction that leads to more kids who thrive. Now it's hard because where we come from affects our brain. But as I've told you, our brain is capable of change. Let me finish with a story and then we'll have time for questions. I have a good friend, Mary Gordon, who developed a program called The Roots of Empathy. And in Roots of Empathy, uh, in um, elementary class, a mum, dad, and baby come and visit the classroom once a month for the school year. So the kids really connect with the baby. They really connect with the baby. And they learn about uh, neuroplasticity, they learn about synapse, all this kind of stuff. They learn about temperament, they learn about nonverbal communication, all kinds of things. So, uh, this, uh, Mary told this story to the Dalai Lama and she said in this one class there was a boy who had, life had not been kind to him. He had seen his mum murdered when he was four. He had been in multiple foster homes and in this class this day the mum, they were talking about, um, they were talking about temperament and so the mum said, you know, we wanted a really snuggly little one but you get you get the child that the creator sends to you. So he really likes to look out on the world and kick his feet. So we got this snuggly pack. So he can go in that and he can look around and I can walk around as well. Would anybody like to try the snuggly? Well, didn't this boy come up and say, I would. So what did mom do? She took the baby out of that snuggly and handed it to him and the baby snuggled right in. And then for the rest of the class, he sat in the rocking chair and the baby just snuggled in and looked at him the whole time. And at the end of the class, he went, he gave the baby back to mum and he said to the Roots of Empathy facilitator, do you think someone who's never been loved can learn to be a dad? Well, I want you to remember that story because that tells us about the power of connection. That tells us about the power of hope and the power of one individual making a difference in the lives of kids. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we the one individual that's going to make a difference in the life of your own kid? I have to ask us as professionals, can we bring all of our powers of one up together so that all of our kids, no matter what their circumstances, can thrive. So I'm going to leave you with that thought, say thank you, and open the floor for questions. So thank you very much.